Okay, Christine Ravson, thank you so much for being here. Uh, first of all, what can you tell us about Julian Assange's state of health and the conditions in which, in which he is put through? Julian Assange is now in uh, Belmar's prison, which is uh, called the Guantanamo Bay of the United Kingdom, which describes the circumstances. It was built for terrorists and murderers. He has been there for three and a half years, most of the time in solitary confinement, uh, under horrible conditions. Uh, his health is bad. It was already bad before he went to prison in Belmars. Uh, after seven years in, uh, in closed as an asylee in the Ecuador embassy. So he is not in a good condition and uh, I fear for him. Okay, and the case has to do with, with more than 200,000 leaks that WikiLeaks published uh, regarding the clandestine um, ways of working of the, the US forces, right? Do you remember about the, that day, the, the day that it, they were published? What are your thoughts about that, that, that time? Well, I was around for and took part in the biggest leaks, which are the basis of the uh, indictment against Julian by the US government. And it's uh, one of the aspects is the, uh, the leak of 250,000 diplomatic cables from the embassies all around the world. But there was also field reports from Afghanistan, field reports from the military in Iraq, exposing the war crimes in Iraq. And not to forget uh, uh, the release of the so-called collateral murder video, which I took a very uh, deep part in, because that was exposing a war crime in a video. And uh, it is now can be seen online and people should review it and see that an evidence of war crime is there online because of Wikileaks. But nobody has been held responsible for that. It included killing of two Reuters journalists, a lot of innocent civilians, and wounding of two young children who uh, just uh, happened to stumble upon the scene when uh, their father was driving them to school. Uh, his, their father was killed in the incident. So I was around for those releases. It was a, um, a stressful time for obvious reasons. Uh, a small organization like Wikileaks was there with the biggest scoops in the world. Uh, the diplomatic cable release was a, a very uh, interesting project from a journalistic perspective. I'm a journalist for 20 years before joining Wikileaks. It's because we were working together with uh, more than 100 media organizations all around the world as media partners in this release. It was stressful, it was powerful in a sense that it was great journalistic work. Uh, one of the greatest journalistic feats of the, uh, the century. Uh, 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 that is no doubt about that. And uh, it's an honor to have taken part in it. Uh, I don't miss those times in a sense because there was not much sleep. So this great journalistic work regarding this scandalous video, um, how is it so contradictory to the, you know, the way things are done in Western liberal democracies? Now, how do you, if you can compare, for example, freedom of speech and this piece of journalistic work, and on the other hand, it's, prosecu it's prosecuted. Of course, the release of the, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, video, for example, and all the reports from the, uh, the, the military uh, exploded the official narrative about the war in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Uh, it exposed the, the criminality of the war and the disparity in, in power between this massively imperialistic army and uh, the people on the ground who were being massacred. Uh, the average journalist and the average media was not reporting anymore on these incidents. Uh, the, the dying and uh, the killings in the small numbers became just routine reporting and nobody seemed to care. It. But when you got to the aggregate of all these incidents, you could report on, uh, on, on a systematic scale what was going on. The systematic uh, uh, program of uh, basically killing people. And that was part of that, uh, that uh, overall objective in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that was the essence of it. It was the, all these incidents where a, a, a family was killed because a guard on a checkpoint was shooting up at a car that didn't slow down quick enough. So the American military opened fire and they killed everybody. This is just just like five people killed in one incident. Nobody would care. It was just a routine story on and on. But when you get it all together in hundreds of thousands of military cables, their own account, 
and you aggregate it, that is when the, this explosive picture emerges. Uh, 15,000 new names of killed civilians that we could report out of these documents and from Iraq, for example. When it came to this helicopter video, the collateral murder video, which I took uh, part in preparing for its release, I was then a television reporter in my home country and I went into a media alliance. It came through my friendship with Julian, who was staying in my country at the time, and he entrusted me with, the, with that video and I said, I want to work on that. And so I traveled to Baghdad uh, because I needed to know the identity of these people. Who, who were they? What, what went on? The, the little report we had from the US military was just a few paragraphs because it was standard things. It didn't matter really. The fact that we had the video exposing and, we could, and I analyzed it in details over weeks, frame by frame, and I know the conversation that went on between the pilots and the gunner heart, uh, by heart by now. And it's not a, 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 a pretty experience. And it was shocking that to go to Baghdad, go to a residential neighborhood, seeing this happened in a neighborhood where just people were just trying to cope with the situation of war. It's a neighborhood where people were just hanging the laundry out to dry, trying to go to the market to get something to eat, trying to create a world for the children uh, that has some kind of normality in the state of war. And this is, for example, one aspect of the video uh, showing, which I then could collaborate on the ground, that. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the man that came upon the scene in the minivan was trying to rescue Said Sma, who was a Reuters employee and was wounded in the first instant of the shooting. He was simply taking his two children to school, who were sitting in the front, Said and Doa. Uh, there were two neighbors who were in the van, he was giving them a lift. And they come up to the scene, they see an, an injured man, a Reuters journalist, and of course, they, they, they are good Samaritans. They try to rescue him, take him to a hospital. That's when the, then the, uh, uh, the helicopter opens up fire again and all obliterates the, the van, kills all the adults there, including uh, the Matasser Tomal, the driver of the van, who was found uh, dead after throwing his body over the two children in the front of the vehicle. It's an obvious war crime. I met those children. I met the, uh, the widow of, of uh, Matasa Tuman. They get no compensation, no acknowledgement that they had been victims of a war crime. It was totally dismissed as a war crime, even though it's there, it's online, it's been seen by millions of people. But total Im impunity for that act, which is totally unacceptable. And the only thing that we could bring to those victims was the realization that they have been wronged. And those two children who are now in their early 20s, the only thing that they, uh, we could uh, uh, give to them as journalists was the knowledge of how it came about, that they were deprived of their father who was killed in the incident, and how it came about that they are still having scars on their body and on their souls because of that incident. That is important. That is what journalism is about. So it's so inspiring your experience as a journalist, like kind of facing, you know, like a huge empire at some point. And um, I think that, that that is something that also happened to Julian, right? And going back to, to his side of the story and, and the situation he's going through, um, when, you know, the, the British courts ruled in favor of the extradition mm. of Julian, uh, WikiLeaks actually declared it a dark day for press freedom. Yes. So um, why uh, is this case um, an attack to one of the pillars of Western liberal democracy, this democracy that the US defends, you know? It's because this is a, such a grave attack on uh, the freedom of the press. It is criminalizing journalism. It is calling standard journalistic procedure and actually the duty of journalists, as I was describing earlier, as a crime, as espionage, as something you put people in jail for. There is nothing in what Julian Assange did, or what uh, that I did, or my colleagues in this expose, that went outside the framework of ethical journalism, as I know it from my 20 years experience before joining WikiLeaks, and what, what, what everybody agrees today is a standard practice. There is nothing in the indictment even that alleges in any credibility any, any attempt to, to step outside the framework. It's just simply not there. 
So on a legal basis, it's a, it's a nonsense attack, but it has nothing to do with the law. It is attack on, on an individual on the basis of revenge. It is sending a signal, don't report our truth if they are inconvenient or hurting our interests. Don't go there. That's a signal being sent to every journalist everywhere in the world. And if Julian Assange is extradited to face these indictments based on the espionage, they call journalism espionage, basically in the indictment. There's not a single journalist safe in the world from a similar fate. They are claiming universal jurisdiction to try to get an Australian citizen out of England to put him in jail in the United States. He didn't even practice his journalistic work in the United States. He did so in Germany, in Sweden, in Reykjavik, in Iceland, in my country, and in the United Kingdom. So it is a, a grave attack because it sets a precedent. And if we cross this barrier, he is the first journalist and a publisher that is faced with the Espionage Act charges in the United States. If this goes ahead, not a single journalist is safe anywhere. And it will hurt journalistic practice all around the world. That's why people are flocking to the cause and understanding the deep meaning of it. It's not because they are trying so hard for Julian Assange's life. Many do, including me, because he's my friend. But people do understand that this transcends Julian as a person. It's about journalism. It's about basic principles of journalistic practices which are under attack. And if we attack journalism on the on, the, on these on these basic elements of, of, uh, of what is underlying our journalistic work, we are taking away an important part, part of our democratic process. So I say it's a part, an attack on journalism, thereby an attack on democracy, and if we attack democracy, we are attacking our civilization. So it, it, it is very grave, and people are slowly, gradually starting to understand how important this is for our current time and how important it is to push back and say enough is enough we need to stop this and why do you think this is a lawfare international case and what does this tell us about the functioning of the justice in you know liberal democracies well having experienced the uh, legal proceedings in courthouses in london for years and years and sitting on more court proceedings than I would have cared for. I've come to the conclusion that uh, you cannot trust the judiciary in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it has twisted and turned the interpretation of law. It has uh, uh, taken procedural measures that are uh, totally out of the book and, and scandalous in some ways. So I can't trust it. Uh, and it's shocking to see lawfare being practiced in, in a country like the United Kingdom. Uh, I didn't have any high hopes for the United States because they practice lawfare uh, through procedural manners in a different way. They do it by, by, by picking and choosing their venues for the court processes. They do it by reading information and uh, selectively putting it into a, 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 some jigsaw to create a picture. They do it by throwing all kinds of charges on people and threatening them with uh, tens uh, of years of imprisonment and even hundreds of years to enforce people to do a plea deal. You know, only a few percent of all cases in the United States in courts go to a, a trial. The rest is plea because somebody said, if you don't agree to this crime, some of the crimes, we're going to take you to court and put you in jail, possibly for the rest of your life. It is a mafia state-like procedure of lawfare every day uh, against the citizens of the country. But it was shocking to see this happening in London. And if I may cite the, the investigation by the law professor, Niels Meltzer, who is a professor at law at Geneva and Glasgow, happens also to be a former special rapporteur on torture at the United Nations, and is now a, one of the, the main manager of, of the International uh, Red Cross. He was so shocked in his mandate as a special rapporteur on torture that he investigated fully the entire lawfare against Julian. And he came to the conclusion that he had never seen any example of such a coordinated attack on an individual, not by one state, 
but by four states, by Sweden, the United Kingdom, the United States and Ecuador after the regime change in Ecuador when, uh, when uh, Lenin Moreno took over from uh, Rafael Correa. That is extraordinary, but that's lawfare in these, uh, these Western countries and uh, there seems to be a growing tendency to use that in other countries. I just came from, uh, from uh, Brazil where I, I met Lula. Uh, Lula, of course, was a victim of lawfare uh, in itself, and so therefore he, therefore he sympathizes, he understands the importance of the fight for Julia, because he himself was prisoned for more than 500 days, and a very unjust procedure was taken down through, through lawfare. So it seems to be now a growing weapon of choice by the institutional powers to take down those who go against the power in one way or another. The shocking truth now is that journalists are now, in a growing number, victims of those lawfares. Apart from journalists, and you bring Lula's case, our Vice President, Cristina Kirchner, also denounces that she's a victim of lawfare. Mm. I know you visited her, and yeah. um, recently, you know, she's been put through a, a justice procedure and um, she denounced uh, and there's actually a, a new leak Argentinian leak a new about um, like a journey between um, judges and mm. members of the opposition well alleged at least and uh, she she said that this was part of the lawfare against her mm. are you aware of this and as a journalist how do you think about it what do you think about this well, I, it would be very hard for me from a distance, I don't even speak Spanish, to, uh, to, to put myself in a, in, a, in a deep dive and learning process about every details of this case. I was aware of it before I came here and uh, I met uh, uh, the Vice President the day before the judgment fell. Uh, on the same day I was told about these leaks, uh, which uh, had a familiarity, so to speak, to me. And I, I, I find it Let's, let's put it this way, I cannot f make any judgment about, uh, about the entirety of the case, but there is, I find it very credible that uh, that should be coll collusion among the judicial elite to take down somebody on a political level, and that's very, very concerning. Uh, I, don't find it, I find it also credible that it should happen here, that there is a collusion between the judiciary and monetary power and the elite. I find that credible. Uh, on prima facie without knowing the details of it because it happens elsewhere. It happens in other countries and I'm referring to the Western countries, the, the, uh, the, the countries that, uh, that we are dealing with in the US and the United Kingdom. So let me put it this way. There seems to be a, 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 a very strong indication, at least there's a whiff, that there's a politicization of the process when it comes to Christina. The vice president. I cannot be a judgment about all the elements of the case, but it's enough to uh, to uh, to have the feeling through my talking to the people here in these short days, even people who do not agree with Christina, even the people who do not agree with with uh, her being innocent, they still admit there is a politicized angle in the procedure, and that is worrying. That means that, uh, that justice is not being done. And uh, when it comes to these leaks, I don't know the details of it, only the, uh, the general broad strokes. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a worrying indicator of the possibility there is a, a, a politicized and a crooked and corrupt political process in the judiciary. And I would not be surprised, and I wouldn't even, not even sort of uh, condemn it as being uh, a regional problematic issue. My God, we are seeing the same problem in every country. And as I said earlier, if it's happening in the United Kingdom, if it's happening in Sweden, why shouldn't it be happening here? So people need to be very aware of this danger because it, it's undermining the foundations of our society and it cannot be allowed to continue and go on uh, whoever is, uh, is, is involved in, in the, the procedure that is uh, underlying these, uh, these tendencies. Okay, Christine, I think we've had like 
lots of definitions from you. I thank you so much for this time. And I would like to invite you if you want to make a final comment or reflection about this issue or whatever you would like. I would love to reflect upon <clears throat> the revelation that I have had in this, uh, this, this tour of, of Latin America and the exceptionally good supportive voices that I have heard from the people that we've been meeting here, from the, from the presidents uh, on the highest level of the political spectrum, uh, to organizations, to uh, uh, individuals. There is a deep understanding of the issues that are underlying our case. Part of it is, of course, cultural, because it is so near in living memory, a dangerous time for people that are middle-aged and my age in this country, and the same applies to Brazil, and we don't have to mention in Colombia, that I don't have to uh, overcome a barrier of disbelief, like often when I'm speaking in Europe. I don't have to convince anybody what, that the, what the CIA is capable of. I don't have to convince anybody it's not a conspiracy theory that CIA was plotting to kill or kidnap Julian Assange. People, of course, have that in their own history and it's their own books and living memory. But my takeaway from this region is, is, is really heartfelt and I, I want to send back the message that it's a, of extreme importance to the rest of the world to get this message out of a unified Latin America, one of the most important nations in this, on this continent, that this cannot continue. This is a message that cannot be ignored in, in Washington DC by the Biden administration. And it's also sending an encouraging signal to other world leaders who have stayed silent and now are forced to make a statement because they cannot stand silently by when an entire continent take a very firm stand on such an important human rights and freedom issue. So my gratitude is so great towards this country and the other countries that I've, I've visited. And it's a, it's a, it's a heartfelt takeaway from such a, uh, a, a trip. It's been very successful in that respect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.